And uh, the verses that I'm dealing with tonight are just these verses um, 15 through 17. Where we read, And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now, since our reading, let's ask God's blessing on his word. Father, again, having read your holy and infallible word, a word that's, uh, that has so much power and so much excellence, but yet a word that can only be mediated through, your, through the working of your Holy Spirit. Father, be with me. Bring forth, uh, order my, my thoughts my heart, my mind, and, and be with my mouth and bring forth a good word. And be with each one here present and that they would be strengthened, encouraged, and blessed in your word. And for those who do not yet know you as, as Lord and Savior, Father, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, may they turn and may they come to know you um, in all your glory and all your excellent love. All these things we ask in Jesus' name alone. Amen. There's a very ancient story uh, about a small village near the mountains. And in that village, there was a man, an uh, older man with a family, very poor. And this old man had one thing of great value. He had a horse, beautiful, gorgeous stallion. And uh, people came from far and wide to see this horse, and he was offered a great deal of money. And the villagers told him, you should, buy, you should sell that. That's all you got. Sell them, and you can live a little bit better than you do. And he said, would you sell somebody that was a member of your own family? Whatever. And uh, after a while, his horse ran away. His horse ran away, and uh, the villagers came and said, see, we told you. We told you. You're a fool. You, you should have listened to what we told you. We told you to sell them. Now what do you got? What do you got? Nothing. He says, you know what? I don't know. Who knows how this thing might turn out, for good or for evil? Sure enough, a, a week and a half later, the stallion came back, and, and there were 12 wild horses with him that he had found in the mountains and led him back and had become the leader of their band. And the villager, and they were able to corral them all, and, and the villagers came back, and they were saying, oh, man, you're right, you're right. That, that was amazing. You were right. That, that wasn't a bad thing. It looks like it's a good thing. Now you can, now you can break these horses and, and, and sell them and make all kinds of money off them. He says, who knows whether it's a good or an evil thing. He says, we'll just have to see. So a little while later, a couple weeks later, his son was breaking one of the horses, and, and the horse fell on him and crushed both his legs. It sounds like he was going to recover, but it was going to take several months. And the villagers again are like, oh, old man, you are right. You are right. You, you were right. And we saw it as a blessing. We saw it as a great thing, but you didn't know, and, and now you're, you're, you're right. Now your son's got broken legs, and look at this. And he says, Who knows? how it will turn out. And again, just a little while later, messengers from the king came into the village and they said that a neighboring kingdom had invaded their kingdom and now the king was looking for soldiers. And so every able-bodied young man and, and middle-aged man had to go to fight the king's battles. And the villagers came again to the old man and they said, old man, you were right. Now your son can't go and he won't die in the battles and you'll still have your son. And at this point, the old man just like, just walks away. Didn't have anything more to say to him. He says, I, I, I can't deal with a people like this that all they think about is what happens right in front of them right now. Now, that's not a Christian story, but there's a story that you and I can learn from that, right? My sense is that whoever wrote that story was probably a stoic they're not a Christian, but they were someone who understood something about life. 
that life, a life lived, is, is, is more like a stream that goes around curves and goes up and down and through this and through that. And you and I never know where exactly where we're going to end up. But we have a tendency in the American culture, um, and you and I are part. Oh, we're part of the church. We're, we're Christians. We're not part of the American culture. No, you are part of the American culture, and so am I. There's something about the American culture, and I believe it's probably because of materialism, that there's something about the American culture that, that the only thing that we look at is what's happening right now. So if something's good, then it's great. We're being blessed. Thank you, Lord. If something's not good, it's like, oh, no. Oh, no. What? Oh, no. This is bad. This is, this is bad. This is evil. You know, this is wrong. And then if something comes out of it later on, we'll say, oh, it was a, it was a hidden blessing. We can learn something from people who learn to look at life in a little bit longer term than just what's happening right now. You see, brothers and sisters, I believe that when we look at the Word of God, the Word of God actually instructs us a lot about how to live our lives, and particularly about how to look at trouble. And the Lord has promised, you know, it's January 3 of 2021. This is the first Sunday, it's the first Lord's Day of the new year. And I, I'm looking at this text with that in mind. With the year ahead, what can we expect? Well, the Lord promises us several things, but one of the things that he promises us is that there will be trouble in the world. This is what I know. I don't know who's going to have a great year here and everything's going to go fantastic and you're going to be on an upward ascent and, and you know, next year you're going to look back and say, wow, man, that was an awesome year. We just did great this year. What I do know is that most of us will experience trouble. We will experience trouble. Maybe, for some of us, it might be a medical problem. Maybe it might be an economic problem. Maybe it might be a relationship problem. And at some point or another, you and I are going to be tested, we're going to be tried, we're going to be pushed to our limits. So how will we deal with with trouble when it comes. God's word teaches his children that those who have ears to hear um, and a heart to understand, he teaches us how to deal with this trouble. And that's what I wanted to look at in this text. You see, this text is amazing. It's gorgeous. I spent a whole bunch of time and didn't get hardly anything that I could preach to you today, but later on I hope. Okay, because it's one of those texts that there's, it's a big story. It's an important story and I can't tell you that story tonight. What I wanted to do is just pick one tiny little piece out of this story because there's a picture there. It's a picture that I think we'll find useful and I hope that with a short meditation that the Lord will, will bless us with it, okay? But it's this picture of this man, okay? So the king of Syria has heard that basically Elisha is like a radar. He's like a 24 hour a day radar detector he hears everything. He hears everything and knows everything, every threat that's coming against Israel, and he sends to the king and warns the king so the king can avoid the trouble. So the brilliant king of Syria says, hey, let's go grab this guy. You kind of wonder about that, right? Because, I mean, if he, can, if he, knows, that, if he knows that you're coming after the king, won't the same prophet know that you're coming after him. I, I don't know. But anyway, so the king thinks, well, we'll go grab this guy. Where's he at? He's at Dothan. The only other place in the, in the, in the, in the Word of God that mentions Dothan is uh, Genesis 37, where we find Joseph going to find his brothers, and they're in Dothan. And it says, and they saw him afar off. And the reason is, is because Dothan is like a little flat-topped hill, 150, 200 feet tall. And it sits in a, in a valley, so there's a flat valley all the way around it, a, a, a pretty fertile valley, and it's kind of in the north-central Israel. It's north of Judah, Judea. It's, it's up in the north, but not quite up to Galilee. So Dothan is this hill, and it sits in the middle of a valley. So if you're on this hill, you can see all around you. Well, in the middle of the night, these guys come, and these, the, 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 the soldiers of the king come and they've got chariots and they've got horses and they surround this mountain. 
So the young servant lad, probably 12 to 14 years old, gets up, goes outside, just light enough to see, and maybe he hears something. He hears a horse blowing a little bit. He starts looking out there and he hears something else. The clinking of a harness. And he starts to look out because it's just out there and he sees horses and chariots. And he turns over here and he sees horses and chariots. So he runs probably a couple hundred feet to the other side of the village to look at the other side. Everywhere he looks, there's horses and chariots of the Syrian army. They are completely surrounded. And this young man, I think, I want it to be almost like a parable of any one of us as God's children. We're standing here, and we wake up one day, and there's trouble. And this man sees two things. He sees first the power and the strength of the enemy that is against. Everywhere he looks, he sees an enemy. And at the very same time, he also sees his own weakness. His own ability. What am I going to do? How? Uh, we're surrounded by trouble. Everywhere I look, there's trouble. And I do not see any way that I can get out of this, or, or me and, and the old prophet here are going to be able to get out of this. How are we going to do this? Everywhere I see, trouble. And, and brothers and sisters, I see in this an image. It's an image of every child of God who is walking through the world, and at some point, we find ourselves in trouble. We find ourselves, in, and there's trouble everywhere. Jesus promised us. He says, there is trouble. There will be trouble or tribulation in the world. That's a promise he gives us. It's not a promise that he likes to give us, but it's a promise that he tells us because it's based on the fact that we're sinners. We're sinners in a sinful world. And that means the world is full of trouble. So there's different kinds of trouble, right? There's big trouble. Many of us who study politics and study what's going on in the nations and the kingdoms around the world see a lot of trouble, right? You can look on the top of this hill and you can look around. And whether it's, whether it's nations Right? We've got huge nations that want the same kind of things that we want that are now um, pushing against us and uh, they're opposing forces and, and so we're, we're, we're against them and, and they're against us. But we also have this whole underlying political thing. Right, there, there, are, there are companies, corporations that own all the information and they own the media and they're telling one story. And you know what? That story has nothing to do with this story. Nothing. And so if you have an eye for that, and some people do, not everybody does, but some people look, and they stand on this little mountain, and we're looking around, and all we see is the strength and the power of the enemies around us. But brothers and sisters, that's not the only trouble we look at. We also look at all the other troubles that can assail us. Right? If you have a son or a daughter or someone you know and love, and they go wandering. And at first you just pray for them and you don't think it's that bad, but then you keep praying about it and keep reaching out a little bit, and little by little you start to find out more. Maybe one of them's playing around with homosexuality. I can tell you, I can promise you this, as going to every classes in Michigan in the last 10 years, I can't tell you how many times we've heard that story. Maybe you find out that this person you love is deep into drugs and alcohol. I'm going to tell you something. Brother and sister, anybody here that has had somebody that they love involved with drugs, alcohol, porn, whatever, you know what I'm talking about. Because once you begin to realize how bad it is, I watched a, a documentary on a, on a boxer from the 80s and 90s the other day. And this guy was good. I mean, he was really good. And won some championships and, and world championship belts. But he was a partier and a, a, a drinker and cocaine. And he had, a, he had a wife, wonderful wife, strong wife, tough. But at a certain point, she says, you can't. Right? 
So they, they dragged him along, and he was able to do both things, box and kind of party in between. But it got to a point that the, the fights got further and further. Uh, there was a bigger and bigger space between each one of them. Finally, uh, his, his trainer came, came and said, come on, one more. I got one set up. You know, you can make a couple million, et cetera. You know, so they got him in a training camp. He started training for about two, two and a half weeks. And then he came to his trainer and he says, you know, I know what you're trying to do. And he says, I can't do it. I'm done. I'm quitting. He's like, come on, champ. You were the best in the world. You can do this. You've done it before. And the guy says, I know it. I was at the highest level. And he says, and I know I used to be that. He says, but now I'm just a junkie. And, and it just hit me so hard that, that he's got a family, he's got children, he's got a life, but he doesn't care anymore. It's down to whatever this little thing is. And I'm telling you something, if you experience that, it's just like standing where this young servant is. He's standing there and he begins to see the power of the enemy everywhere. How do you make... How do you break into that, right? Because prayer feels like kind of a weak thing at that moment, right? Because you've been praying and you've been praying and you've been praying through the years and, and this person isn't coming back. And you feel like you're on that hill and you're looking around and everywhere you see, trouble. Or you get diagnosed with cancer or some other dread disease or you lose your job. Or something happens and it hits you hard and all of a sudden you're on that hill and everywhere you look, you see the power of the enemy. You see the strength of the enemy and you see your own inadequacy. You see your own weakness. But let me tell you something. We can learn from this young man. Now, granted, in the story, he has no other place to go. But what do you and I do? What do so often we do when we run into trouble? What is our first action? All right, women are probably a little different from men. Men know the answer. We whine. We start with whining, okay? Ah, ah, this is terrible. Ah, I can't believe this. Ah, this is not fair. It's not right, you know? And we'll find one reason after another to whine because we like to whine. Men like to whine. Not really, but that's what women say. Okay, no, they do. <laughs> but we do. We cry. We like to kick the curb and get angry and get frustrated, right? Because it makes us feel powerful even when we're feeling powerless. And we look and we think and we try to analyze anything that we can do to find a way out of this trouble with the least inconvenience, the least cost to ourselves. And at the point that it's happening, we really don't even care about God's word. Honor, character, integrity. Yeah, if I can cut a corner and get my job back, right? If I can reach across the aisle to some bum to help me out, I'll do it. I don't care. So often, you and I, all of us, so many of us, when trouble hits, we try to go all down these, all these different avenues. But this young man can teach us something because the first thing he does is he just sees the trouble and he turns to Elisha and I can't go into detail tonight because we don't have time. But Elisha is a Christ type here. He is the Christ type. When he's speaking to, to Elisha, he's like speaking to Christ because Elisha is the mediator between God and Israel. God is, Elisha has has. He has a place with God. He can speak to God, and God speaks to him. And God works on other people's behalf through Elisha. So he is clearly a Christ type. And so he says, alas, my master, what shall we do? The first thing that you and I do when we get into trouble in this year, and we will, think about this, think about the hill. Think about looking around and you see the trouble and you see our inadequacy. And before we start going down all these different avenues that we usually try to find to get out, let's just stop for one moment and say, 
alas, my master, Lord Jesus, what shall we do? Let's start there. And then listen to what he says. He says, he does, he says two things and he, and, he, and he does a third thing. The first thing he says is fear not. And I love this point. I could finish up on this point, but I'm not going to. So I'm just going to make it two minutes long. It deserves more. Fear not. This is the lowest level, but oh so good. 500 times the word of God says, says fear not. 500 times God says to his people, fear not. All through the word of God, fear not. Now, you think about a child. Think about a toddler, right? A toddler hears a loud bang, runs around the corner, and sees a German shepherd for the first time. And that German shepherd sees him, and he doesn't know that he's actually scared of the toddler, but the toddler sees him, and the German shepherd opens his mouth and barks, arf! Right? What happens? The kid freaks, right? You know he does. He's scared, and he runs. And what do you do? You pick them up. And you hold them. And what do you say? Don't be afraid. And you know what? He doesn't know why you're not supposed to be afraid. He doesn't know why he's not supposed to be afraid. He has no idea what this animal is or what it's capable of. And he's not even really thinking about it. All he's thinking about is, I'm scared. But all of a sudden, this person that I know, trust, that I trust, He's bigger than my trouble. And he's holding me. And he's telling me, don't be afraid. Jesus Christ promises every one of you, every one of you that knows him, has come to him, believes in him, trusts in him, he promises every one of you, you have no reason to be afraid. Right? Because that's what he actually says in the text that I've been quoting. The text that I've been quoting, right? Uh, John 16, verse 33, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tri tribulation or trouble. You will have trouble. But be of good cheer, be of good courage. I have overcome the world. So first Jesus says, fear not. Right? When you're scared, turn, stop. Don't go out down the roads that we always go down trying to figure out how we're going to overcome the problem. Just stop. And look at Christ and say, Christ, Lord, help me. And the first word he'll give you is fear not. Then he tells us the next level. He brings us up, right? Because as a toddler, as a, as a little one, an infant, you don't even need to know the reason. And the reason doesn't even matter why you should not be afraid. All that matters is you know that the one that you trust, the one that's bigger than your trouble, is holding you, comforting you, and saying, don't be scared, and you're not scared. But the second level, as we get a little bit older, we need to know more. We need to have some kind of reasoning. Why? Why, Lord, should I not be afraid? And he says, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And again, brothers and sisters, it deserves a lot of time, but I promised, Brian and Andrew and Rita, that we're going to be done early tonight, okay? So I'm going to make good. But those who are with us are more or greater than those who are with them. Now think about what you started out. You're on the hill, and you're looking, and everywhere you can see is the strength and the power of the enemy, and they are bigger and stronger than you every time. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. The power of the world, the power of the devil, the power of sin, it is stronger than us every time. We cannot defeat that enemy on our own. It is bigger. It is stronger. But Jesus says, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are greater than those who are with them. Right? My father has, uh, he said to Peter, right, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter cuts off the ear of Malchus, and he, he turns and, and Jesus says, do you not think that my Father could send me 12 legions of angels right this moment? The God who creates the heavens and the earth. Listen to what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 32. The beginning of a prayer at verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. Nothing. 
When you and I turn to Jesus and we stop and we start, we just come right away to the end and just say, Lord, this problem's bigger than me. I don't know what to do about it. The first thing he's going to do is calm your heart, fear not. The second, he's going to assure you that whatever the enemy is, whatever the power is, whatever, whatever the trouble is that's around you, that surrounds you, that his strength is greater and it's more. And, and brothers and sisters, many Christians, that's, that's the only point we ever get to. And you know what? For some, it's enough. Right? To just believe the words. Because these are the words of God mediated through his servant Elisha, but now mediated to us through Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says this in Romans 8. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Right? The God who has, who has defeated Satan and the world and sin, raised his son from the dead with all kinds of witnesses to let us know that he has done, and what he has done is pleasing in my sight, he raised him up from the dead so that we would know that his sacrifice was enough. What's that? What, 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 what is he going to hold back from you? What power, what strength is he not going to give you? And finally, the last thing the prophet does is he prays. He says, Lord, open his eyes so that he might see. You know, I was doing a little bit of study about um, New Year's resolutions. And they say that like over 50% of the people make a New Year's resolution. And then last year, they, they went back and checked the people that did it in the beginning of 2020. And they asked them, you know, they went through the same people they asked, and, and they said, you know, how'd, how'd you do? 8%. 8% succeeded in their resolution, kind of tells you how strong humans are. We're not strong, are we? My prayer for all of us this year is that the Lord would just open our eyes. That he would open our eyes, first of all, so that we would have this confidence that when trouble hits, and it will at one time or another, if not our trouble, my brother or sister's trouble, it will hit when it does. First of all, open our eyes to see that the, the number one help we have is in you. Open our eyes to believe that the word of God is true. Right? Because the, the world around us, I mean, you, you look at, some of the corporations and the worldwide corporations that own all the information and are buying up all the information about everybody, the Googles and the Microsofts and, and the Amazons and all these huge corporations, billion dollar companies, and the sports entertainment um, companies that are just huge conglomerates. And you look at the power and the strength of the world. And it's easy to look at the church it's easy to look at some words on a, in a book and to think, are you really there? And it's at that point that the prophet says, open his eyes, Lord. Open his eyes so that he can see. And his eyes were open. And, and at the, when I preach about this again, Lord willing, we're going to talk about what he saw. But he saw a fire. He saw chariots and horses of fire. He saw fire really speaking about the power and the glory of God. And he saw it filling. It's all above the mountain, but especially above Elisha. All this power of God is focused down on this one man. And this one man is being given the, the power of God to do whatever he needs to do to defeat the enemy. That's the power of God that he gives you in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, 
When you come to him in prayer and faith, believing, believing the words of God, believing in the reality of God, believing in the reality of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the power. And that's the power. When he opens your eyes and says, whether it's a, it's a loved um, family member that has gone astray, you know what? God's message might be to you, look, you know what? In my time. But in the meantime, you keep praying and you keep reaching out and you don't stop. If somebody's sick or hurting, you know what? Keep praying. Keep believing. And pray that God will give you the confidence to see that he can do anything. But he's going to give us all that we need. He's going to give the people that are, that are going through it. He's going to give them what they need. He's going to give us the ones that are around them, that love them. He's going to give us the power and the strength to love, to care, to pray, to reach out. And that's my prayer, is that God would open our eyes so that as we, we don't know what comes ahead of us. You and I have no idea, just like that stream, where it's going to go next, where our life is going to lead next. We don't know. But this I do know, that God loves us, and he's given us his son. And he has more power than all the power of the earth. And he has more power than the sin that's within me. And he has more power than the sin that is without. And he is the king of kings and the conquering king. Believe him. Trust him. Amen.